Um, ever since I've been pastor at Gulf Creek, I have used this Sunday right here to be the Sunday to promote our 21 day fast where we dedicate our year to the Lord at the beginning of each year. But I almost changed my mind on Christmas Day this week. Christmas Day morning, we got up to do Christmas with the girls and then had a little extra downtime. I spent some more time than usual in the Word of God, a Bible study, my devotion. Still had some downtime. And so I got on my phone and I was just surfing the net and looking through some of my apps and stuff. And I got on with my CNN app. And there was a story on the CNN app that said the majority of Americans believe in the Christmas story from the Bible. And I opened it up and it said 65% of Americans believe in the Christmas story as it's told in the Bible, including the virgin birth. Now, I personally think that number's high uh, because 65% of Americans don't go to church. But that 65% number falls right in line with uh, other studies that we've seen that say two-thirds of American Christians. Well, then I kept on reading in the survey, and it said that the number increased from 65% that believed in the Christmas story and the virgin birth to 81% that believed in the Christmas story and the virgin birth if you just surveyed the Christians. Eighty-one percent. That means nineteen percent of the people that claim to be Christians do not believe in the biblical account of Jesus' birth. Are you kidding me? That means two out of every ten people that claim to be a follower of Jesus Christ do not believe in the authenticity and the infallibility of the foundation on which our faith was built. Church, if you can't believe in the virgin birth, how can you believe in the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ? How can you believe in any of the miracles that Jesus performed? How can you believe in His teachings? How can you believe in the writings of Peter and Paul and James and John? How can you believe the great Old Testament stories of David and Goliath, Joshua and Jericho, Daniel and the lion's den, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace, the parting of the Red Sea, the plagues in Egypt, Noah and the ark, Jonah and the whale, and I could go on and on and on. I've said this before, church, and I will say it again because obviously only 81% of you believe me. Every single word contained in this Bible is completely accurate, completely true, and completely reliable. This is the only book in the entire world that you can successfully stake your life upon. You can't build your life on the teachings of Oprah and Dr. Phil and Dr. Oz. You can't even build your life on the writings of the great preachers of our day. And you certainly can't build it off of what you see on the internet. You can only build a successful life on the teachings of God's Word. I've heard people say, well, the Bible says it. I believe it. That settles it. No, 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 no. The Bible says it. That settles it. Whether you believe or not does not make it fact or fiction. The Bible is complete, total, 100% fact with my hand up. There are no contradictions in the Word of God. When you read everything in its proper context, <coughs> Now listen, we can all isolate and manipulate individual verses to say things that we want the Bible to say. But listen to me, church. The Bible gives us a warning that we are not to do that. Look on the screen of Revelation 22. For I testify to every man that heareth the words of this prophecy. If any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plague written in this book. If any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things that are written in this book. Oh yeah, Brother Philip, but when it comes to the Bible, the Bible was written by man and since man's imperfect, that means there must be imperfections in the Bible. First of all, friend, you're wrong. The Bible was not written by man. The Bible was written by God Himself through His Holy Spirit. And He, only, he just simply allowed man to hold the pen and put it to paper. How do you explain 40 different authors?
empires on three different continents over a period of 2,000 years, yet the Bible maintains a consistent message from cover to cover. Friend, I hate to be the bearer of bad news to you, but if you're in that 19% of people that call themselves Christians but don't believe in the authenticity and the accuracy of the Bible, you need to have your head examined for staking your eternal destiny on something you don't believe to be the whole truth and nothing but the truth. You're crazy. It'd be like trying to drive a car on four flat tires to California. It'd be like going bird hunting with a BB gun. Don't make no sense. I cannot encourage you any stronger to believe it all. <coughs> to believe it all. From the literal creation accounts of Genesis all the way to the end time prophecies of Revelation. And church, when you have a question, and look, we are going to have questions when we dive deeper into the Word of God. When you have a question, search for the answer. If you can't find the answer, call me. Text or email me. We'll find it together. Tell me, do 100% of you this morning believe that the Bible is 100% accurate, 100% true, 100% of the time? If so, say amen. 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 If you don't, I'm going to pray a curse on you and all your babies and grandbabies are born naked. <laughs> Watch out. It'll happen. Now that I've been on my soapbox, I'm serious about that infallibility. No, don't mistake that. Now that I've been on my soapbox, I'm going to start preaching. Turning your copy of God's Word to the Old Testament book of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 58. Isaiah chapter 58. We're going to begin our reading with verse 1. If you don't know where Isaiah is, it's okay. I'm going to help you find it. Turn to the middle of your Bible. You'll probably be in the Psalms. Then keep turning to the right. You go through Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, a little book called the Song of Solomon, and then you'll be in Isaiah. Now, let me tell you up front, we're talking about hard to understand stuff. Isaiah is a hard book to understand. But when you break Isaiah down, there's a whole lot of similarities between the book of Isaiah and the Bible itself. For example, did you know that Isaiah has 66 chapters just like the Bible has 66 books? Did you know that the Old Testament has 39 books and the first section of Isaiah has 39 chapters? Did you know that the second section of Isaiah has 27 chapters, just like the New Testament has 27 books. Do you realize that the New Testament begins with the ministry of John the Baptist and the first part of the second section of Isaiah begins with the prophecy of the exact same. Look on the screen in Isaiah 40 verse 3. The voice of Him that crieth in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for God. That's prophesying John the Baptist, which is the same thing at the beginning of the New Testament. If you get to the end of Isaiah and the end of the Bible, they talk about the same thing as well with the description of the new heaven and the new earth. But guys, for the purposes of our message today, we're going to concentrate on Isaiah 58. Isaiah chapter 58 and the 14 verses in there. And these 14 verses are basically in a nutshell a back and forth between the Lord and His people. A back and forth between the Lord and and his people. And I'm telling you, we're going to get a whole lot out of this this morning. If you're in Isaiah 58, verse 1, and you're ready to read what you say, amen. amen. If you don't have your Bible with you, you can follow along with us on the screen. <clears throat> Cry aloud, spare not, lift up thy voice like a trumpet, and show my people their transgression and the house of Jacob their sins. Yet they seek me daily and delight to know my ways as a nation that did righteousness and pursued not the ordinance of their God. They ask of me the ordinances of justice. They take delight in approaching to God. Wherefore have we fasted, say they, and thou seest not? Wherefore have we afflicted our soul, and thou takest no knowledge? Behold, in the day of your fast you find pleasure, and exact all your labors. Behold, you fast for strife and debate, to smite with the fist of wickedness. You shall not fast as you do this day, to make your voice to be heard on high. Verse 5. Is it such a fast that I have chosen a day for a man to afflict his soul? Is it to bow down his head as a bulrush and to spread sackcloth and ashes under him? Will thou call this a fast and an acceptable day of the Lord? 
Is not this the fast that I have chosen to loose the bands of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens, and to let the oppressed go free, that you break every yoke? Is it not to deal thy bread to the hungry, and that thou bring the poor that are cast out to thy house? When thou seest the naked, thou, thou cover him, and that thou hide not thyself from thine own flesh? Then shall thy light break forth as the morning, thy health shall spring forth speedily, thy righteousness shall go before thee, the glory of the Lord shall be thy reward. Then shall thou call, and the Lord shall answer, thou shalt cry, and he shall say, Here I am. If thou take away from the midst of thee the yoke, the putting forth of the finger and speaking vanity. If thou draw out thy sword to the hungry and satisfy the afflicted soul, then shall thy light rise in obscurity and thy darkness be as the noonday. And the Lord shall guide thee continually and satisfy thy soul in drought and make fat thy bones. And thou shalt be like a watered garden, like a spring of water whose waters fail not. And they that shall be of thee shall build the old waste places and thou shalt raise up the foundations of many generations. And thou shalt be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of past to dwell in. If I turn away thy foot from the Sabbath, from doing thy pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy of the Lord, honorable, thou shalt honor him, not doing thine own ways, nor finding thine own pleasure, nor speaking thine own words. Then shalt thou delight thyself in the Lord, and I will cause thee to ride upon the high places of the earth, and feed thee with the heritage of Jacob thy father, for the mouth of the Lord hath spoken. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight this morning. O oh, Father God, my strength and my redeemer. Lord, you know that I'm weak today. My voice especially is weak. But Lord, I'm so thankful that you are strong. And Lord, I want to ask you right now to just get out of me the message for your people today. Lord, I'm nothing and I'm a weak man. I cannot do this on my own. I cannot do this without your Holy Spirit working through me and speaking through me today. Father God, may your message fall on further than that. May it be a challenge to both the Christian and the non-Christian alike. Lord, we love you and we commit this to your care and keeping safe the souls here this morning that are near the gates of hell and on their way there. In Jesus' name, amen. These 14 verses that we read in Isaiah can be broken down into four basic parts. If you're keeping note this morning, part one is God's reminder to His people. God's reminder to His people. Look back at verse one. Cry aloud, spare not. Lift up thy voice like a trumpet. Show my people their transgression and the house of Jacob their sins. Now I don't know about you. But I am tickled pink that the Lord sends us reminders and doesn't just tell us something one time and cut us off. My wife gets tired of reminding me to fold and put up the clothes. My dad gets tired of reminding me in the summertime to go bush hog the fields. My daughters get tired of reminding me at night to come tuck them in bed and kiss them goodnight. But praise God, the Lord in His limitless, infinite mercy and grace sends us reminders every single day of our life. Let me give you an example. Even though I know I don't need to go eat some of those delicious, mouth-watering, heavenly Krispy Kreme donuts that are now on the of the world. <laughs> Even though I know. When I drive by there, the Lord sends me a reminder. Boy, you ain't got no business doing that. You swell up like a poison dog. <laughs> Even though I know that I'm not supposed to do work on Sunday. The Lord sends me a reminder through the reading of His Word to remember the Sabbath and to keep it holy. Even though I know I'm supposed to give to God my first 10% of the income that He gave me in the first place, and even though I know that He's going to give it back to me, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, I still need to be reminded sometime when I write that check. And so in the same way, here at the beginning of chapter 58 of the book of Isaiah, God is sending His people a reminder. And guys, this is not a little subtle reminder. This is not that still small voice. This is not that little gentle nudge in your, in your conscience. No, no, no. Look what the Bible says. Cry aloud. Spare not. Lift up thy voice like a trumpet. This is a loud reminder. Nothing's going to be held back from this reminder. This is a reminder that is guaranteed to grab you and get a hold of your attention. Now who's he sending this reminder to? It says right there in verse 1. 
My people. He is sending this reminder to my people. The Lord's people. His people. This message, guys, is not for the unchurched and unsaved. This is for the followers of God. This is for the Christian. This message is not for the harlot and the heathen. This message is for the saved and sanctified. Now let me stop right there just for a second. Our government gets a whole lot of blame for the problems in the world today, and I understand that. But friend, the problem is not just in the White House or the School House. The problem is in God's house. It's in the church house. It's in the Lord's house. And He knows that. So He's sending the Lord's house a reminder. Look, we Christians, we kept silent when Madeline Murray O'Hara raised her voice to take prayer out of schools. We Christians kept silent during Roe versus Wade that made abortion legal. We Christians kept silent and let the lottery get passed in Tennessee. We Christians kept silent and let them put a liquor store in here and wine in grocery stores. You want to know why they're putting all these sinful things in our neighborhoods today? They're doing it in the name of raising tax revenue. Well, let me tell you something, ladies and gentlemen. We would not have a revenue shortage in America if all 50 million of those aborted babies were tax paying citizens. We wouldn't be having that revenue shortage. This whole illegal immigrant amnesty stuff, both sides of the aisle want you to think that it's about compassion to the fellow man. No, no, no. Let me tell you what it's about. The illegal immigrants are the ones that's doing a lot of work. They want to make it legal so they can start getting taxes off that money. Friend, we can have ten times that amount of money and more if we simply had to kill those babies in their mother's womb. Second Chronicles 7 14 says, If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face. And turn from their wicked ways. If my people shall turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, forgive their sin, and heal their land. The Lord knows, church, that the problem is not just at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue, the White House. It's not just in our schoolhouses. It's in the church houses. And so the Lord in Isaiah 58 is sending a reminder to His people. Now what's the reminder about in Isaiah 58? It says right there, the transgressions and the sins of His people. In a nutshell, here's what's going on. The Lord is admonishing His people for having religion, ritual and religion, and not a relationship. He's admonishing His people for having ritual and religion, but not a relationship with Him. They've got this form of godliness that kind of looks like something real, but it's not genuine. You can tell this in part two of our passage today if you're taking notes. The people's response. The people's response to the Lord's reminder. What was their response? Look at the first part of verse 3. Wherefore have we fasted, say they, and thou seest not? Wherefore have we afflicted our soul, and thou takest no knowledge? In other words, Lord, we really don't understand this because, Lord, we fasted like we thought you wanted us to fast. And so we just figured that you just didn't see us fasting. And, and, and Lord, we, we afflicted our soul like we thought you wanted us to afflict our soul, but we just thought you were so busy that you didn't pay us any attention. Friend, this response here is essentially no different than Cain's response back in Genesis. Cain made him. You know, Cain, instead of looking inwardly at his heart and what he might have done wrong, he blamed God. Same thing happened here in verse 4, 50, in uh, chapter 58. Instead of looking inwardly at what they did wrong, they started blaming God and accusing God of doing something that He is incapable of doing. Being unjust and unfair and unaware of something that's going on. Well guys, the same thing happens today. Thousands and thousands of years later. We get in the habit and the ritual of doing church, going to church, operating the church, managing the church, we just going through the motions and there's no real relationship and there's no real power behind it. We've substituted religion and ritual for the righteousness and rewards of Jesus Christ. Hmm. I submit to you this morning that a lot of folks in this building right now, a lot of people watching me on the internet, could win an Academy Award for impersonating and acting like a Christian. 
You can talk the church talk. You can walk the church walk. You can say the right things and give the right answers at the right times. But friend, the Lord does not want an act out of us. He's looking for the real deal. All that good acting won't mean a thing at the great white throne judgment when you're standing before Jesus Christ and He says, Depart from me, you worker of iniquity. I never knew you. You acted like I knew you, but I never knew you. You can fool Brother Philip. Oh, man, I'm easy to fool. You can fool your spouse. You can fool the people that you work with and the people you hang around with. But you cannot fool God. Now guys, I can talk about that right there because I've done it. I've been there. I've done it. I've got the t-shirt for Battle Scars to prove. In my past, I have just gone through the motions of religion. And it's the most empty feeling I've ever had inside. You're looking for something to fill and to quench that thirst. Yet you're more thirsty when you leave church than you were when you came. You're looking for something to give you answers to the questions of life. Yet when you get through, you've got more questions than you do answers. So what did I do when I was in that situation, guys? Instead of blaming God and saying, well, God, it's all your fault. I'm doing what I've been taught to do. And I'm doing all that. No, 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 no. What I did is what the Bible says to do. And it says, let a man examine himself. And I looked inside my heart and I examined what was wrong in my own heart. And from that experience, I answered the call to start Yellow Creek Baptist Church. I want you to listen to me. My prayer from day one, for everybody that walks through those doors from the first time they walk through, to the last time we walk through. I pray that you feel this place is real and reverent and not ritualistic and religious. Here in Isaiah 58, they didn't look inside. They blamed God. And that brings us to part three of our text today. If you're taking notes, the Lord's rebuttal. The Lord's rebuttal. He says at the end of verse 3 that in their days of fasting, instead of being afflicted like they said they were, they were actually finding pleasure and doing the exact same things in the days they were fasting that they were doing before they fasted. You remember what you've heard me say before? If you fast without prayer and drawing closer to God, that's just a diet that don't do you a bit of good spiritually. That's what was going on here. Then in verse 4, the Lord told them that they were fasting for vain things, not in accordance with His will. And when you do this, that your prayers won't be heard on high. Then in verse 5, the Lord tells them they were putting on the show. They had bowed their heads just like a bulrush uh, bows its head, and they put on sackcloth and ashes to appear like they were fasting. But instead of, what, instead of putting on a good show, what the Lord was wanting was their hearts to be bowed, not just their heads bowed. At the end of verse 5, he chastised them some more. He says, you call that mess that you're doing right there an acceptable fast? And then he gets to verse 6, and he begins to tell the people what he's really looking for. He's looking for fasting and prayers that will get rid of the sin and the wickedness in our lives and in the lives of the other people we're praying for. And guys, he makes that clear not just in Isaiah 58, but from cover to cover of his word. We're to repent and we're to get rid of the sin in our lives. We're not to play around with it. We're not to make a home for it. We're to not tolerate it in any shape, form whatsoever. If you've got a pet sin that you're holding on to, the Lord is telling you today it is time to repent and it's time to get rid of it once and for all and to quit playing around with it and you can get rid of it through fasting and prayers to God. In addition, he tells us that he's looking for some fasting and some prayers to get rid of those heavy yokes of life that weigh us down. The financial burdens that we carry. The physical burdens that we carry. The emotional and psychological burdens that we carry. He wants to pray and fast and to get light of those burdens so we can live life in the fullness that he wants us to live. In verse 7, he's telling us that he's looking for fast 
that will positively impact the lives of other people, those that are in need of food, those that are in need of shelter, those that are in need of clothing. In other words, we're not just to have selfish fast. Gimme, give gimme, give gimme, give gimme, 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 gimme. <coughs> we're to have fasts that will positively impact the lives of other people. That brings us to verse 8 in the last part of this section. The Lord's reward. The Lord's reward. Starting in verse 8, the Lord gives us a long list of rewards if we'll just simply do what He's telling us to do. Now look, I cannot say this any better than the Scripture, so listen again to what the Scripture says our rewards will be. Then shall, this is verse 8, start in verse 8. Then shall thy light break forth as the morning. Thy health shall spring forth speedily. Thy righteousness shall go before thee. The glory of the Lord shall be thy reward. Then thou shalt call, and the Lord shall answer. Thou shalt cry, and he shall say, Here I am. If thou take away from the midst of thee the yoke, the putting forth of the finger, and the speaking of man. And if thou draw out thy soul to the hungry, and satisfy the afflicted soul, then shall thy light rise in obscurity. Thy darkness, your darkness, shall be as the noonday. And the Lord shall guide thee continually and satisfy thy soul in drought and make fat thy bones. And thou shalt be like a watered garden, like a spring of water whose waters fail not. And they that shall be of thee shall build the old waste places. And thou shalt raise up the foundations of many generations. And thou shalt be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of the past to dwell in. Hallelujah, church. What more can a man ask for? A light to bring us out of darkness. Good health. The glory and the favor and the blessing of God on our lives. Being able to call upon the Lord and know that the Almighty, all-knowing, ever-reaching, everlasting Creator of the universe is going to answer for us. Being able to say, Lord, Lord, and know that He's going to say, Philip, Philip, here I am, here I am. Having God to guide us every step in the paths of righteousness. Being able to be continually satisfied by Him even when we go through the dry times of life and knowing that not only will He give me and you these rewards, but He's also going to send them to our children and their children and their children and the generations on down to come. And we will have a legacy of blessing in our family from the throne room of heaven. Friend, what more can you want than that right there? <coughs> it's promised to us. He made that promise to us right here. If we'll just do our part and fast the way He's asked us to fast. Now you remember when it comes to the Lord's promises, He's never broken a promise. He's never gone back on His Word. He's fulfilled every commitment He's ever made. And He's promised right here in Isaiah 58 that if we will simply do what He tells us to do, that He will do His part and we will be rewarded more than we can ever fathom. Now let me bring this home to all of us today. And let me talk to you about the last point of today's message. Point number one, the Lord's reminder. Number two, His people's reaction. Number three, the Lord's rebuttal. Number four, the Lord's reward. And last but not least, what our response should be. What our response should be to Isaiah 58. Now in just a few brief minutes, I'm going to talk to you about the technical aspects of fasting. And the reason I'm going to do that is because we've got many, many, many people in our church that have never gone through that 21-day fast to begin your year and to dedicate your year to the Lord. And so, I'm going to go through the technical aspects of it, but listen to me very, very carefully right now. Do not get bogged down in the technical aspects of what you can eat, and what you cannot eat, what you can do, and what you cannot do. Don't go to these websites on fasting and do all that. Don't get caught up in all that legalism. When you do that, you're no different than the people here in Isaiah 58. That's not what the Lord is looking for. The message for the Lord's people from the Lord's Word through the Lord's man on the Lord's day, listen, is that our motive for this 21-day fast is way more important than our method. I want to say that again because I want it to sink into everybody here. Our motive for this 21-day fast is way more important than the method. 
Simply going through the motions of this fast church and not drawing closer to God and not praying to the Lord is just a diet. It won't do us any good. When we fast for vain things that are not in accordance with the will of God, Isaiah 58 says He's not going to listen to us. And what did we learn in this passage here, Isaiah 58? What did we learn that are things that are in accordance with His will? Loosing the bands of wickedness and sin in our lives and the lives of others. Undoing those heavy financial and physical and emotional and psychological burdens that weigh us down. Letting the oppressed go free. Helping those that are in need of food and shelter and clothing. And what's going to be our reward if we fast for these things? We'll have the favor and the blessing of the Lord on our life and the lives of our ancestors. We'll be able to call upon the name of the Lord and know that He's going to answer us. He's going to take those heavy yokes and burdens off of us and we will be like a fully satisfied watered garden no matter what stage of life that we're in. Hallelujah, church. Give me one good reason that you don't want to fast for 21 days. Give me one good reason that you don't want to participate in this fast and get all those great rewards. Fasting to start the year has absolutely changed my life over the last few years. And it's affected many people in this church family. I'm looking at a young man right now that's here as a result of fasting. We've got kids in this church that are here as a result of fasting. There's people in this church that have jobs as a result of fasting. There's people in this church that have been healed and their family has been healed. When the doctor said they were their hope, and that happened as a result of fasting. If you want the same old, same old, same old in your life, you just keep doing the same old, same old, same old. But if you're ready for something that can only be described as spectacularly supernatural, then I'm asking you to join me in the fast for 21 days, starting this Saturday, January the 3rd, at 6 o'clock that night, and going through Saturday, January the 24th, at 6 o'clock that night. Now, for those of you that have never fasted before, here's the technical things that I want you to know. If you've got questions after the service today, if you've got questions this week, call me. You can write this down. I'll send you all my notes. You have everything you need about this. There's four basic types of fast. The first fast is the Esther fast. This is where you don't eat anything or take in anything. No food, no water, no nothing. And let me just be honest with you. I don't recommend that. If you do it, don't do it for a long period of time. And do not do it without consulting your doctor, okay? I'm just telling you that because it's in the Bible. Here, here's the second type, the one that I usually participate in. It's the liquid only fast. This is where you just drink water, juices and protein shakes, things like that. Liquid only. Now, here's how I want to encourage you to do this. If you have never, ever, ever liquid fasted only before, I don't want you to jump in there even and attempt it for 21 days. I'm not doing it for 21 days. If you've never liquid fasted before, I want you to do it for one day. One day. Start at 6 o'clock Saturday night and go to 6 o'clock Sunday night. Eat you a big supper Saturday night. You'll go to bed. You'll wake up Sunday morning. You're going to be halfway there. You'll come to church and hear me preach and you'll forget about eating. <laughs> Then after you get through with church next Sunday, you'll just have a few hours to go and you'll be there and you'll have your first day done. So if you've never liquid fasted before, I just want you to do one day. If you have, I want you to do more than you ever had. For example, with me, the most I've ever done is five. So this year, I'm going to try to liquid fast for six days. Okay? So you just take the most that you've ever done and try to do better. If you've never done it, do one day. If you've done it before, if you've done it two days, do three. If you've done three days, do four. Like I said, in my case, I've done five and I'm six. Then after you get through with that, that leads us to the third kind of fast. And that's the Daniel fast that we find in the book of Daniel. This is where your fruits and vegetables only. No meats, no breads, no sweets. <laughs> right, same thing on the drinks. Water, protein shakes, juices, stuff like that. But vegetables and fruits only. And then after the Daniel fast, that gets you to the fourth kind of fast, the Lenten fast. And this is where you kind of give up something like you've given up something for Lent. 
But it has to be something that's important to you. Like a few years ago, my dad gave up sweet, uh, eating sweets for 21 days. Um, I know some people here at this church that gave up drinking Mountain Dews. I know some people that gave up eating chocolate. I know some that gave up eating peanut butter. I know some that gave up Facebook. What you do there, guys, is between you and the Lord. Remember, the key is not the method. Don't get bogged down in the technicalities of what you can and cannot eat, what you can and cannot do. The key to the fast is the motive. That brings us to the second part about fasting that you need to know. You need to fast with a purpose. Fast with a purpose. You must have a defined purpose of what you're fasting for. Now maybe you're like me. Your purpose is related to your family, your finances, your friends, your ministry here at the church. Or maybe you've got a, a big situation in your life. And the only way out of it is a supernatural touch from Almighty God. Or maybe you just don't even have a clue what your purpose for your fast could be. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to start right now. And for the next six days until six o'clock this Saturday night, I want you to pray and ask God for what your purpose for the fast should be. Lord, what do you want me to pray for? Lord, who do you want me to pray for? What do you want me to pray for? Then write that down. That's going to be your purposes. You may be like me and you may end up with multiple purposes. That's fine. I've got people that I'm praying for for salvation. I've got things like that that I'm praying for. And so you need to have that purpose. And then once you have your purpose, you need to fast with a plan. A written out plan. I call this our fasting contract. And after the invitation day, we're going to pass these out. And everybody here is going to get a fasting contract. This is your plan. How you write down you're going to fast. And it says on here, I'm going to fast the following way. Liquid only, like I'll put on there for six days. Daniel fast for the remainder of the 21 days. Or maybe you're going to liquid fast for a day. Maybe you're going to Daniel fast for a week. And maybe you're going to do a liquid fast for the rest of the 21 days. I, I don't know what your plan is. Remember, not the method, the motive. The method is between you and God. The motive is what's important. And then down here at the bottom it says, my purpose for fasting. And you write in your purpose for fasting and why you are fasting and what you are fasting for. And that brings us to the last part of fasting that you need to have, and that's to fast with friends. Fast with the purpose, fast with the plan, fast with friends. Why do you need to have friends fasting with you? Because from personal experience, I'm telling you, Sometime over those 21 days, you're going to want to eat a whole bag of tater chips and you're going to need somebody to holler and say, Help! You're going to need it. In the Old Testament, when the man of God would call the people of God to fast, I would know you were fasting, you would know I was fasting, and so we could support each other. And so... Here's what we're going to do again this year that we did last year that worked great. When we hand these fasting contracts out, everybody's going to get two. One for you to keep yourself in your Bible. And the other one for you to fill out and to give to somebody else, preferably not in your immediate family. And for that person to be your accountability partner through this fast. For example, I may give Brian mine, Brian may give me his, Heather may give hers to Aaron, Aaron may give hers to Heather. So I'm going to pray for mine and Brian's when I pray for his and mine. Same way with Aaron and Heather. Back and forth. We pray for each other. These are the methods that we're going to use for this 21-day fast starting this Saturday. But remember, church, the method is not as important as the motive. And I hope that you've grasped from this message today that there's a lot of wonderful things to be received from participating in these 21 day fasts. Now, last but not least, unapologetically, unapologetically, this message today has been focused on the Christians here at Yellow Creek Baptist Church. And I hope the majority of everybody here is a Christian today. 
But friend, there's no way in the world that I would assume that everybody here is a Christian. Oh, Brother Philip, I'm a Christian. I believe in Jesus. But they must not hell believe in Jesus. <laughs> oh, Brother Philip, I'm a Christian. I go to church. The devil goes to church more than you do. He hadn't missed a Sunday yet. <laughs> oh, Brother Philip, I, I'm a Christian. I've never been arrested. God's not concerned about whether your name's in the book and law. He's concerned with whether your name's in the book of life. I want you to look very carefully at the book of Amos, chapter 4, verse 12. Therefore, thus will I do unto thee, O Israel, and because I will do this unto thee, listen to these five words, prepare to meet thy God. Are you prepared to meet God today? Are you prepared to meet God today? We just got through with Christmas time. And there was a lot of preparations that had to be made with family and friends. My mother and father-in-law are here this morning. I love them slap to death. But let me tell you what happened on Christmas Day. Christmas Day, I told you, was Christmas with the girls. Had a little downtime, read my Bible. Had a little more downtime, got all that CNN out. And then you know what I had to do for a solid hour on Christmas Day? I had to fold clothes. You want to know why? Mama was coming. We had to get prepared. Because Mama was coming. Do you think I wanted to fold clothes for an hour on Christmas? Walmart ain't even working on Christmas. We had to get prepared. I see these men that are in uniform this morning. We've got three active duty men on our front row, and I appreciate all three of y'all both of you never know me. But these men have to be prepared for what they're going to see in battle. Derek's flying helicopters. He's got to be prepared if an engine goes out. <coughs> these guys are doing different things, and they've got to be prepared. Are you prepared to meet God? Man, you don't just get prepared by being a good person. No, no, no. It's an event that you will remember, that you will never forget. Let me tell you what happens if you're not prepared. Just like if Derek's not prepared flying that helicopter and an engine goes out, if you're unprepared to meet God when you die, instead of being absent from the body present with the Lord like the Christian, you're going to take your last breath here on earth and you will go to the most horrible place imaginable in total darkness, total snow, chains, weeping and crying unimaginable that you've never heard, torment, torture, heat, pain, fire. It's going to be the most horrible experience you've ever experienced. You won't know anybody around you. You're not going to be having this big time with you and the boys. It is just going to be so terrible that the human race was never supposed to be there. And then after years and years and years and years and years of that, you're going to be taken out of there and you're going to think it's all over. But all of a sudden, you're going to be in a line at the great white throne judgment. And eventually your number will be called at the great white throne judgment and you'll be standing face to face with Jesus Christ, just you and Him. You're not going to have any lawyers or mom and daddies or anybody over here. You're just going to be standing face to face with Jesus Christ. And because you were not prepared to meet God, you're going to have to answer for every sin you have ever committed in your entire life right there standing flat-footed before Jesus. And then after you answer for every single one of those sins, because you were not prepared, He is going to cast you into the lake of fire. And you're going to be there forever. That's what happens when you're not prepared to meet God. What happens when you're prepared to meet God? It's what's happening with Miss Mary Breeden right now at the nursing home here. She may not be alive right now. But 
even on your deathbed, you're singing stuff like the old Roman cross. You're saying, what's that little white man there at the foot of my bed? Is that veil is cut between this life and the next. And there's a peace in that room that the only time you ever experience it is when that sight is going to go home. When you take your last breath here on earth and you prepare to be God, you will open your eyes in the morning to paradise of heaven. Where yes. you will not have any pain, where you will not have any sorrow, where you will not have any stress, and you will not be even cared for. You will be in the presence of the Lord of God. You will be there with Him. You will enjoy the marriage supper of the Lamb. And we'll be ushered into the new Jerusalem where we'll spend an eternity in this paradise forever. That's what happens when you are prepared to meet God. <laughs> Hebrews 9.27 says, It's appointed unto man once to die, but after this the judgment. The best thing you can do on the last Sunday of 2014 is to get prepared to meet God in case your number's called in 2015. Or God forbid your number be called before the end of this year. You're not going to be able to escape death or judgment. The best thing you can do is to be prepared for it. Are you prepared to meet your God? Will you pray with me, Heavenly Father? I'm thankful for this message to the Christian this morning about our fast. I'm thankful for this message that encourages us about not just the method, but the motives. And that we don't need to be going through the motions over this next 21 days, but we really need to be concentrating on the method and the reason that we're fasting and the purposes of our fast. And God, uh, I, I just pray, Heavenly Father, that over these next six days that you will just speak to every Christian here about the things that we need to be praying for, and drawing near to you for during this fast. And Lord, we look forward to the answers and the rewards that you're going to send our way. And Lord, I'm thankful for the message to the non-Christian this morning. Asking them straight up if they're prepared to meet God. We may be prepared for retirement. We may be prepared if we have a flat tire in our car. We've got a spare. We've got a jack. But we're not prepared to meet you anytime. Lord, for the people under the sound of my voice right now that are not prepared, show them they're not prepared. Give them the courage to get prepared this morning. 